Well, as a gamer, I mean, I grew up on all the, you know, the old classic systems, you know, the Famicom and the, the PlayStations, and even I think I had the, was it the PC, the, uh, uh, the NEC PC thing. That I wanted to play Street Fighter, so I remember getting that and stuff. But, you know, I grew up, you know, playing games on the PC and everything, and so, you know, that's, that's a big thing. And I have to say, like, right before I got my big break on Heroes, I was literally like a an officer, a raid leader for World of Warcraft, Progressive Guild, for those who know what that means. It means it's a time suck. And uh, I was literally on there doing that until like I got my Heroes gig, so. And then you got a real job and there went to gaming. Well, I, I, it was funny because I actually cold quit and then I got back in under a different uh, avatar name. And, but like I would be on set and I remember I would be like texting my guild mates and say, hey guys, uh, I'm not going to be able to be there for the first few bosses. Can you cr clear trash? Because like when I cold quit, I said like, I'm not going to be an officer, anything. But then of course I got kind of sucked into doing like becoming a main tank. So I'm a main tank of a raid. It's like oh no, and I'm shooting a show, and it's like okay, I'm on set. We're not going to finish shooting here, but uh, I hope they're okay. Ah, it's all right. We've cleared those bosses. You guys clear the four first three bosses. I'll be there soon, <laughs> kind of thing. So. What was it like? Because you actually ended up being in the Heroes Reborn video game yeah. as well. Oh no, I was. Well, I mean, they made a game, and okay. you were you were involved in the sense of. I have zero idea. <laughs> I I don't know. They just use our likeness, I guess. And uh, you know, it's uh, we were lucky to be able to do Heroes Reborn, given the CBS show I'm on uh, Wi-Fi as well. So yeah. thanks to NBC and CBS for letting me do that. But I wish I was I wish I was involved a little bit more. You know, because like back in the day, in the old Heroes, I had a great idea for a video game, and you know, but you know, it's. I get it. It's not my property. It's just yeah. my character. So, but so that's why I created a game studio. And uh, now yeah. we're making great independent games. Yeah. So talk a little about the role you see indie in the indie games playing in this landscape today. I think it's really important because nowadays, you know, there's a lot of money being poured into the AAA titles, right? And you get the big publishers. I get it. It's a business, you know. And especially with the is everything going down, you know, mobile taking a lot of the you know the money away and the customers away from console gaming. You know, a lot of people need insurance, right? So they're going to go for big titles, big production values. So, so it's a big home run or not. And what makes it that? What that does is kind of takes away from the middle tier and the low end, where you used to have the kind of the fun, innovative games and the quirky games, even like the Katamari Damacy's, you know, of the world or the Mosquito games. There's all these strange things that Japan was great in innovation on, but the publishers aren't taking the risks anymore. So that's the I think the creativity is in the independent games, where especially you know. Everything's all about multiplayer and you know, like shoot 'em up, you know, FPSs, you know. And I grew up from the like, RPGs and stuff, so I miss kind of like the one person experience as well, where you could kind of just like be in a sandbox and like play with so, But you know, a lot of places they need to make money, so they need to go online, they need to go multiplayer, they need to be a subscription business. So that's why I kind of like want to support independent gaming where the creativity still is. Talk a little about the games you have released already on mobile. On mobile, we have like a Terrachroma uh, and Beacon uh, 88, which uh, you know, they're kind of like a they're, they're adventure games in many ways. One, the first one's like a puzzle uh, RPG. So it's a different new mechanic where you're drawing pieces to uh, create. Uh, it's, it, I, I kind of like liken it to Cuber for some reason. <laughs> but it's like a binary XOR. And like if you put an ice on top of ice, it becomes you know, light kind of thing. So it's kind of a color like logic puzzle game. So it's very cool and I think it's a very new mechanic. And uh, it's a big world, so you know, so there's a lot of gameplay. We also have Beacon ADA, which is kind of like an explore, exploration game. You know, kind of like it's a horror Lovecraftian kind of theme. So that's kind of very cool too. Uh, we had a lot of feedback that was pretty hard, and our our guys are developers who are like gamers, so <laughs> they're they're kind of geared towards more of like the hardcore audience. But you know, I think we made something really beautiful and uh, and narratively driven. So and that, that's something we believe in. And how involved are you in the gaming development? You know, as much as I can be, unfortunately, I'm you know doing a lot of other stuff. So, but I'm there for like the uh, the the pitch meetings in the beginning. Where we're coming up with a concept. You know, otherwise, you know, I have a great staff. You know, there's a great group, bunch of group. You know, headed by Avi and you know, uh, Loam or no, and uh, you know, Alex Beecham and, and like those guys are really great. And you know, they they just do the day to day. I know they're in there even today. You know, working on Outer Wilds. That's our you know most recent title that we're going to go out with. So. So I trust them, you know. I wish I could be involved more, you know, but they do a great job. You know, I don't think I could be a coder again. <laughs> it's gonna take a little while to go back into it. So I figure, you know, I, I you know, I, I should spend my time elsewhere uh, when I can, when let the people who are really good at it now do it.
Well, a lot of people don't realize you're a coder and that when they see water in pretty much any movie, it's your digital creation. Oh, that's, that's going way too far. <laughs> if they saw Perfect Storm, yes, they can say that. And maybe some of the uh, some of the effects close to Perfect Storm that ILM did. But, you know, the problem is like when we work for a company like great public like ILM, we get great projects and we always have to be innovative, right? And come up with new technology. And, you know, in VFX, it's all about making it look good, but fast. So it has to look good enough, realistic enough. So that's you know what we're good at. So we come up with cheats and stuff, you know, to make it fast and process faster, but visually good. And the problem is we're not a software company. So a, you know, a great software. By that that time we had like there was an Arite, you know, I'm sure Alias Wavefront, you know, those guys are doing fluid dynamics, you know, and those guys are software companies. So after we just we just create something for a, a show, a movie, and after that, you know, it's it can be reused maybe one or two more times. But the software companies can support it and they just come up with new technology. And most of the time, our stuff becomes obsolete. So that's kind of the sad part. You know, it's kind of like we develop it, it's like, oh, well, there's two years later, someone else already, you know, there's a better software for us. But at the time when we created it, it was state of the art. And the great thing is we get great customer feedback. You know, because like our users are right there. And they like use it in ways that you never think about. It's like, wait a minute, I coded it this way, but I didn't know you could do that. That's kind of cool. But that shouldn't happen, you know, kind of thing. So. So let's talk a little about Outer Wilds. Yeah. Oh, Outer Wilds is fantastic. You know, it's a, we call it camping in space. It's being developed right now. Um, you know, we, I think the release date might be earlier next year is what we're targeting. You know, we're, we're, you know we just want to improve the artwork and the graphics. You know, it, it won the uh, 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 what was it? Uh, the IGF Grand Prize. Uh, la not this year, but last year, and you know, it was one of uh, Alex's uh, USC thesis. So we were very fortunate enough to be able to do that and uh, kind of recreate and finish his vision. So that's what we're doing right now. Updated with more content and uh, updated with a lot more graphics. You know, it's, it's for me, it's, it's very mist-like. It's mist, mist in space. So uh, I, I enjoy it. I love playing it, and I think uh, our gamers will love it too. It's also a crowdfunded game. What has that opened up for the indie space? I think the crowdfunding, you know, the Fig platform is fantastic. You know, I, it's uh, it's we we were the first one, so it was a little bit experimental, and we didn't know how it was going to react. And ironically, we had more investment than there was crowdfunding. So that was a really interesting, and I think Double Fine recently finished their Psychonauts 2, uh, and that was all heavily invested too. So that's a great way of knowing that you know we could give back to the investors as well. So the gamers also have a stake in, a, in our game. So. I think it's, a, it's an interesting platform and I think it's still continuing to do and I hope it continues to grow because it gives independent gamers who don't have access or at least immediate access to a, a AAA publishers you know, an opportunity to make a name for themselves and get their stuff on the map. You can't walk around E3 without bumping into some virtual reality headset. <laughs> we'll talk a little about why you're interested in VR specifically. I think VR is so cool because it's, it's the new you know, Wild West, right? People haven't really figured out what the killer content is, especially when it comes to, you know, is it, is it an interactive narrative filmmaking or is it more like an immersive uh, game playing experience? It's, it's really the gray line between film and games in many ways. And people haven't really figured it out. People are trying stuff. As you can see, this year was pretty much an inaugural year with all the headsets coming out. You know, you saw GDC, E3, a lot of VR games coming out. So, you know, I think AR is also down in the future, you know, with Star Wars announcing their mixed reality stuff. But, you know, VR, I think, is, is going to be great and it's in a way, you know, there's still a lot of kinks to be worked out, but there's still a lot of potential there and of taking people into uh, spaces that you would never be able to take them to. So. And it's, and it's very, very, you know, it's funny because like, it's funny trying to come up with content because in games you can't do anything, right? You can't, you can't, you, there's a personal space. But in VR, you could like go right into the camera, right? And like, it's, oh my God, you're in my personal space. Like, what do you, you know? And th that's kind of scary, right? So it has a visceral re reaction and, you know, so it's, it's kind of cool to be able to play with that. It's a different type of medium where we could create content specifically for that. So that's very exciting. Well, you also have infinite space and you're trying to guide players in some way through a story, exactly. even if it is interactive. Even if it is interactive. So sometimes you're guiding, but sometimes you let them explore too. So there still hasn't been a, a de facto approach, and that's what's great about it. Nobody's really made the rules yet, so it's great to explore and try things and see, see what hits. So. For, for many, many decades, people always talked about the convergence of Hollywood and video games. Yeah. Do you feel like virtual reality eventually will bring that together? I really do believe so, because there's... VR is that gray line, it's that fine, you know, line between games and uh, techno uh, games and Hollywood, and you know we need to work together. It's, you know, this is we're feeding against the same audience. You know, I think we have to create and work together and create some great uh, content that can live on both worlds because you know it, it is shrinking. So 
instead of like, you know, saying this is this, this is this, I think great content is great content. Great entertainment is great entertainment. We should be you know, very conscious and also socially conscious in many ways uh, and work together and uh, create great content that would inspire a new generation and open up a new, uh, you know, customer base and, and you know, game, fun, game base, yeah. And speaking of great content, talk a little about your first VR project that you're actually involved with. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. There's a company called Limitless. Uh, you know, they just did Gary the Gull, and uh, you know, which was a, a big hit over at SIGGRAPH, I think. Or was it, was it GDC? I forgot. Which it was GDC was, it was a big hit, too. Yeah, both, both. I think both, yeah. yeah. You know, they're ex Bungie, ex uh, Pixar guys, so yeah, not bad, right? N yeah. Good pedigree. But uh, they're developing a game that I've always imagined uh, would work but it, on a console, but it's like, wait a minute, this works in the VR. So it's called Paradox. Uh, you know, they're developing right now. I can't really talk too much about it because, you know, we're still in the development phase, but I'm very excited about it. It's, it's right, right up my alley. It's, it's a little bit of a you know, time loop, alternate reality, you know, kind of a narrative game is all I can say. When it comes to VR, what are you finding out in terms of the length of these? A lot of these games yeah. early on are shorter, but now we're seeing Fallout 4 come into VR and some of the bigger games coming over. It's, it's interesting because it's all about how you present it. And every individual is different how they react to VR, you know, because you know, I guess you're, uh, what is it, your, you know, vortex, your cortical vortex or whatever. You know, I, forgot, I forgot this. You know, your brain, uh, that's right, cort yeah. your cortex is kind of like figuring out what the balance is, you know, like if you, look right but you're not moving it's, it's like it's weird right so it's just about i think getting the people kind of uh, used to consuming vr content is going to be important and every person is different like some kids can just be in there for five hours while an adult might be done after three minutes you know so i think that needs to be figured out not only just you know, you know the, the mental and the physical aspect but also the psychological aspect so i think it's doing it takes a while it's a you know it's any with anything you got to do some qa and trial and error and see where it goes from there. And when will people be able to play that game? I don't know. We're developing. Uh, we don't have full funding for the game yet. So okay. uh, the company has funding, and we're recruiting people. So uh, you know, and that one, you know, I'm, you know, that's not my company. So right. I'm not day to day, but I'm definitely uh, in contact with them. Hopefully, we'll start developing in fall. And I think uh, that's Unreal Engine 4. I believe so too. Uh, Gary the Goal was. Gary the Goal was. I think that's where they're going to go. So yeah. Cool.